What's going on everybody? Welcome to our homestead. Welcome to our greenhouse. I recently got the results from our soils test back and I am completely shocked. A few of the things I knew about, but some I did not. And it's really important to know how to read this and what everything means. And we're gonna go over that today. And we're also gonna talk about the recommendations that we got for our three garden areas and how we are going to amend those. Let's get going. Now, at quick glance, things in here look pretty good, and I still am able to produce food for my family. However, this soil in this greenhouse is very sick, and if I work at healing it per these recommendations, I will be able to produce a ton more food for my family. So first things first, I've been constantly adding things to my soils here on the property that I thought was appropriate, and everything is organic. And little did I know, my well has a super high sodium content. The only way I was able to find that out was to test the soil first and then look for the culprit of that sodium. And of course, that was my well. And when you have too much sodium in your soil, it can mess everything else up. Okay, there are four really important things on your soils test that you need to know about. So we're gonna go over what those are first and then dive into the numbers on my test. Those four things are pH, exchange capacity of the soil, humus content, and the nutrient levels. Now, most people know about pH, and that tells you whether your soil is acidic or alkaline. Anything over seven is alkaline, anything under seven is acidic. Plants like a soil with a pH of about between 6.5 and 7. And if you have a pH too high or too low, there are minerals that you can add to your soil to raise or lower it. But be careful because it might not be that simple. It might not be adding sulfur to a soil that is alkaline to be able to lower its pH. I'll show you in this report right here. It's a balance of the different minerals in the soil that's going to make a difference. And here's a weird little secret. I have very high sulfur here in the greenhouse, but my pH is alkaline. And that's because my sodium is excessive in here. So like I said, it's not always as simple as adding lime to the soil or sulfur to the soil to change the pH. Okay, the second one is the exchange capacity of the soil. And that is telling you how well your soil is holding on to positively charged ions or cations. Those cations are positively charged ions, or things like calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Negatively charged ones, or anions, are sulfur, phosphorus, and nitrogen. And your soils test should tell you levels on all of those, including some trace minerals. And I'll talk about why that is extremely important to get a test with trace minerals on it. Now on your soils test, you're gonna see the exchange capacity labeled as either TEC or CEC. TEC is total exchange capacity. It's sometimes used interchangeably. You'll see range anywhere from between zero and 15. Now anything under 10 is gonna be a poor holding capacity for those cations in your soil. But that number can also be affected by excessive levels of other minerals in your soil as well. Okay, next one is humus content, and you want a test that's going to give you the humus content. Humus is basically really, really broken down organic matter. If your test is telling you just organic matter content, it's not really telling you much. There are a lot of places out there that'll tell you you cannot ever have too much humus in your soil. You can grow things in sandier soils, like sweet potatoes down here in the south and peanuts, but most things like a higher humus content. Good humus levels are between two and 10%, and those are going to help you hold water and hold moisture in the soil, and it's also gonna help you with that soil texture. And of course, when you're growing things like carrots that need a softer soil to be able to go down and grow properly, a higher humus level in that soil is gonna help a lot. The last one is the mineralization in the soil. Most tests are only gonna give you probably NPK, maybe calcium, maybe magnesium, but you need all of them. You need the iron, the boron, the molybdenum, all of them. So make sure you look for a test, like I said before, that has everything because they are super important and they work with one another. And if you have a deficiency in one, as you'll see on my report, 
you can have a deficiency or it can throw off the other ones. An example is cobalt, which interacts with iron, nickel, and zinc for cell homeostasis or stability. And if you don't have enough cobalt, those other minerals aren't gonna work well together. They all have to be working in concert with one another so that plant can be as healthy as possible. Since I am here in the greenhouse, I'm gonna talk about the greenhouse first because it is very different than the other areas of my garden. So I have the greenhouse, I have tilled beds in the ground in our main garden space, and I also have raised beds in that main garden space that I started via a Back to Eden style. So let's look at this first. My soil pH in the greenhouse here is 7.55. So that's alkaline. So that is quite interesting and a little shocking that it is alkaline. But I did buy this soil and brought it into the greenhouse. Our natural soils out here are uh, acidic in East Texas. Let's go over the rest of this. My humus content percentage is 7.8. So that is really good. And that's because I did start with a nice compost mixed with green sand here in the greenhouse. My total exchange capacity is 32.16. And that is actually pretty good. It's uh, definitely well above that 10 that I told you was really terrible. So I think I'm in a good range there. You can see that my soils guy gave me a particular or desired percentage for our calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium ratio. And that's 69 to 11 to 7 to 1. And below that, you can see my saturation percentages. The calcium is 55, so that is low. And if you look down below under the cation section, you can see that I am deficient in calcium. Check that out. You can see on the base saturation percentage that I am at 21, so I'm high in magnesium. If you go down under the cation section, it says very high. So I'll run through this bottom section here. My nitrogen is measured, they measure that differently. It's an ENR value, which means how much potential nitrogen will be released from your organic matter in the soil in one year. Mine's at 114. 114. That's interesting. They gave me a recommendation of adding feather meal every 60 days. Repeat application every 60 days. Yes. Especially for high nitrogen requir uh, requiring uh, crops or succession crops. Now remember earlier I said that my soil was alkaline, but check this out. I am extremely excessive in sulfur. But wait a minute. A high sulfur content soil should mean that I'm acidic, but it's not. And that is because, go down to the cations, we're gonna look at sodium. That's because our sodium is excessive, and that is from our well. So, just remember, like I said before, if you have a soil pH, you might not know the whole story. If you have a pH that's acidic, don't just add sulfur, because in my case, I'm extremely excessive. If I was to add sulfur, I would hurt things even more here in the garden. Okay, let's keep moving down. Let's look at the phosphorus, and phosphorus is really difficult to get out of soil, if not impossible. Uh, my soils guy was telling me that he used to work on a farm in Colorado, or he consulted with them, and they had an extremely high phosphorus uh, problem, and it is not possible to get that out. So they are having to balance it and add other things that will help to negate that high phosphorus content. So here, they recommend not applying anything. And that includes, check it out, compost, vermicompost, or manure. So I cannot add my chicken manure in here because it's higher in phosphorus. Even though it's got high nitrogen, which I do need, I need to add the feather meal because if I add the manure, even if it's composted manure, I'm going to get too much phosphorus and I've already got, obviously, way too much. The phosphorus is good for uh, fruit and seed formation. The magnesium that I was talking about earlier is good for photosynthesis. Your nitrogen is good for leaf and stem growth. And look down at my potassium right here. Extremely excessive on potassium. And that moves water throughout the plant. But let's look at the recommendation under potassium. And this is why it's so important to get those trace mineral amounts because at this level of potassium, boron is going to get tied up and manganese is gonna get blocked out. So if you've got too much of one, 
it's going to block others which are important for the plant growth and other processes in the plant. And that's why plants get diseases and they get attacked is because the soil is so out of balance. But other soils tests are just telling you the basics when you need to dive down deep into it. And if you go down, it says my boron in the soil is very high. And that's probably because it was tied up by those other cations, specifically potassium. So that boron was not getting into the plants like it was needed. So it's just sitting in the soil because it's tied up. Of course, we've got excessive sodium. That's from the water. Okay, let's go down to those trace minerals. And you can see the boron is high, of course. The iron is solid. So I'm not going to touch anything. Um, I don't need any blood meal or anything like that in here, which I wouldn't put anyway because it can carry disease because it is just dried blood. It is not heated. So be very careful of that. You can see that I do need some manganese. I do need some copper. I'm excessive in the zinc, so I certainly don't need anything with the zinc in it. I'm deficient in cobalt and I have low molybdenum. And check this out, potassium and manganese will work together to ward off bugs by releasing defensive chemicals in a process called SAR. But as you can see, I'm deficient in mag manganese, even though my potassium is high, the manganese is low. So they're not working together to keep those plants strong enough to ward off insects. And of course, there's many other things that ward off insects in it's a balance of all of those minerals in your plant. I want to go over here to the main garden now, and it is almost completely different than this greenhouse. So check it out. My exchange capacity is only 16.1, and it's double here in the greenhouse. My pH is higher because I've got very excessive sodium in the garden, and I've got a pretty decent humus content, so that soil is holding on to the sodium and causing all kinds of problems. It's, it's making it more alkaline. So in this case, I could add some sulfur. You can see that I've got a perfect level of sulfur and I could add some to bring down the pH slightly, but at a 7.31, I don't think I'm gonna mess with it right now. And it wasn't recommended that I do. You know, let me jump back to the greenhouse for a quick second because there's a special note on here and it indicates that I have soil compaction and tightness in here, which is interesting. And that is basically because of the cation imbalance and excess, specifically sodium. If you've ever seen really salty soils, they're kind of chunky and they hold on to each other. And I do have a little bit of that problem here in the greenhouse, even though my uh, humus content is pretty solid. So something that'll help that, and obviously down below, you can see I'm deficient in calcium, is adding calcium to the soil. And that's calcitic lime and not gypsum. Gypsum does a little bit different of uh, a process. So you're gonna want a recommendation of either calcitic lime or gypsum lime. Okay, back to the main garden, and we're gonna look at some things. Of course, I need some nitrogen. Uh, but we're extremely excessive on phosphorus and that's not good. I was adding some manure to that garden and it is just way overdone right now. So I'm going to hold off on it. And then our calcium is high. So that is very interesting. Uh, we're extremely deficient in potassium. Ex of course, we're extremely excessive in the sodium. We know what that's from. I have excellent iron. I need boron, I need manganese, I need copper, I don't need zinc, and I also need cobalt, and then I'm very, very low in molybdenum. Now I'm gonna to jump to the in-ground beds in the garden. You can see a very stark difference. Our exchange capacity is only 7.84. Our pH is actually slightly acidic. It's actually decent right there, 6.75. I said between 6.5 and seven was good, but our humus content is low and we need to bump up that organic matter in the soil that uh, composted organic matter in the soil and then the crazy part is from the raised beds in the garden to the tilled beds i went from being extremely excessive in phosphorus to needing some phosphorus in the tilled beds so i need to put some uh, rock, soft rock phosphate in there as you can see i'm in then i'm good on calcium in the garden but what this is going to tell you and i'm not going to read through the rest of this what this is going to tell you friends is that 
each space is different. Even if you're adding things into your soil that are similar, you need to know what each area really has in it. And then obviously you need to test your water because even city water can be putting some odd things into your garden. And of course, one of them is chlorine and I didn't get that test on the, here because I don't have city water for the garden. But can you grow things with having an unbalanced soil? Well, obviously, yes, look at the greenhouse. And like I said, I do get fruits and vegetables out of here. However, it is not ideal and it's way out of balance and it's causing issues in here like some disease, but definitely the plants are weak and the bugs are really, really attacking everything. If the soil was healthy and the soil was balanced, then my plants would be healthier and they would naturally ward off those bugs. It'd have a higher calcium content in the plant itself, not just the soil, but in the plant itself, and that would strengthen those cell walls. So it's more difficult for those insects to attack those plants. And then the other combination, which I talked about earlier, and there are probably dozens more, which I'm not covering in the video. Okay, friends, I really hope this helps you with understanding your soil's test results and understanding how balanced your soil needs to be to have healthy, beautiful plants. If you have any questions, please leave them for me in the comment section below. Now go check out these videos right here, which is our series on how we built this greenhouse by ourselves. Have a beautiful, blessed day. We'll see you next time. Bye.